Amy. Um, I'm the director of the Northwest Film Center, and I think I know most of y'all, but there are some new faces, so welcome to anybody who's joining for the first time. We've been doing these happy hours since March, and it's been a wonderful way at first to all band together and go, what's going on? And now it's a great way to come together and learn some things about where we're going to go next. So as always, a huge thank you to December and Ben for putting this together, and Tim Williams, who's going incognito with a hat today. I couldn't even recognize him from afar. And Ben will introduce our panelists and folks, but as always, um, please you know, put comments into the box so that we can get to your questions. And also, obviously, tell your friends. We want this to keep getting bigger and growing outside of our regular circles. So if you have friends or students or folks, even outside of Portland proper that you think might be interested in this, let them know. And last but not least, we are 20 tickets away from selling out our drive-in completely. So a special thanks to all of you who has bought tickets and supported it. We, uh, we believe in Cinema Unbound and building a drive-in from scratch during a pandemic might be one of the crazier, most unbound things North, Northwest Film Center has done in a while. But just a huge thank you to all of you who have supported that effort. So I turn it over to Ben and Tim and our amazing group of, of panelists today. Thanks, everybody. Um, yeah, hello, everyone. We're so glad that you could all be here. <laughs> So um, really excited about this one. Um, so our first guest um, who actually reached out and triggered this whole conversation is Ashwini Prasad, uh, who has the book, How to Write Inclusively, an Analysis and How-To Guide that um, we'll throw in the comments of where you can take a look at and buy it. Um, and then we have David Polshock, who's a screenwriter, is all, who's in charge of the ISA chapter Portland. Randall Johnson, a um, screenwriter who is also an instructor, has been an instructor with the Northwest Film Center, written plenty of stuff. And then we have Rebecca Gonzalez and Katmio Garcia, who are both instructors at Open Signal, but also are, along with David, they were recipients of the Playa Resident Artist Screenwriter Residency Award, which um, is something that we did in conjunction with Oregon Film and Playa, and hopefully it will happen again. Um, so yeah, I don't know if Tim wanted to say anything about that before we get going, but. No, you covered it. I was just gonna say, I'm really happy that we're all here and that it does have that connection to Playa. And for those of you who don't know Playa, check it out. It's called Playa at Summer Lake. It's out in the middle of the state. And it's an amazing place to go and, and sort of be inspired. Uh, David went. I know Rebecca and Katmia, you guys still have to go. And we're, we're, we're holding money to make sure you do that because I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, so I'm really, really pleased to have this kind of talent here. Randall actually has helped us with the Playa thing as well. So Ash, you're the only one that hasn't, doesn't have the Playa thing, but I'm hoping that's coming up. And the last thing I'll say is if you haven't read uh, Ash's book, please do. It's great. I've actually read it twice. and I'm getting a hard copy for the office because it is so informative and, uh, I really, really got a lot out of it, and I sort of, uh, I would recommend everybody to take a look at it. So click on the link, take a look at it, and thank you, Ashwini, for actually putting that together. I think it's really helpful. Yeah, of course. All right, thank you. Do you want to just jump right in? <laughs> yeah, let's do it. You guys started yeah. with a good conversation okay. the other day. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, it would be great for, um, I think Kat is on the call too, so it would be great, I think, just to do some quick round of intros. And um, I'm going to pick on Randall just a little bit, but Randall, I want you to do the opening question, because uh, I know you like the nuances and, you know, of course, just have a conversation and uh, opening it up to the folks that are on the call and being able to give them some insight and answers. So hi, everybody. Um, I am Ashwini Prasad, also known as the Inclusive Screenwriter. Um, I have, I'm pretty new to screenwriting-ish, got four scripts under my belt, um, but, I but I have 20 plus years of anti-racism and anti-oppression, uh, social justice work behind me as a facilitator and as, a, as an educator. So what I do is I bring in that lens when I'm doing my screenwriting and writing my scripts. And, um, and uh, yeah, like I was, my, my book is out, it's on Amazon, and it's an analysis around Hollywood and also the publishing company around um, so a lot of the exclusion that's happened. And there's some data and, and some information around that. And then, you know, instead of just talking about what's going on, there's a short how-to guide on how to write inclusively. And uh, definitely, I'm open to discussions if people want to reach out. So, David, you want to? Introduce yourself. 
<clears throat> okay. Uh, so I'm a screenwriter, filmmaker, uh, Portland-based. Uh, the Playa experience, you guys, was incredible. Um, one of the main reasons was because there was no Wi-Fi or internet, and <laughs> just clear skies, uh, animals, lake, just incredible, plus the people. Um, it real, an aside on this really interesting part of Playa is that they combined scientists and artists. So there were novelists, there was a, a person from the Forest Service, there was a biologist, there was the Oregon poet Laura, there was myself. Uh, it was just brilliant. So great, great experience. Um, <clears throat> I'm a screenwriter. Uh, I'm studied with Randall uh, and um, I'm peeling back the layers of my, uh, the, the irony with Randall and I, of course, is with the two old white guys in this discussion. And I'm peeling back the layers of, of my upbringing. I grew up in Klamath Falls, which was one of the last cities in Oregon to have sundown laws. Um, and uh, I have my experience uh, out of that very white community. And um, I'm, um, I, I will just own my guilt for writing token characters and not, and not <clears throat> being fully cognizant of the stuff that I've done over the years and, and how that has been uh, sort of peeling away in the last five or six years as I uh, continue my work. Thanks, and David. A Ash's book is uh, uh, a really great help. I, I'm particularly uh, interested in, um, in the um, sensitivity readers that you can hire to help you uh, get the proper view of, of what you've written. And the project that I was um, working on at Playa is actually about the Modoc Indian War, uh, Native American story, because I grew up uh, on Klamath Lake um, collecting arrowheads on sacred land. Um, so uh, I've been in search of a Modoc uh, partner to write this project. That's David, so great. I love it. Yeah. Wasn't that down in the lava beds, though, in Northern California, too? Yeah, it was a, a siege in the, uh, in the lava beds, which is the border of, of California and Oregon. Uh, the Modocs had lived on that land for 4,000 years, and uh, we came and tried to take it away. Um, it's a pretty morbid uh, story. So. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate you uh, getting a co-author. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. And that's something yeah. that I mentioned in the book, just being able to to have that experience and having somebody to be another eye for you. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. How about you, Randall? How's, how's it going? <laughs> oh, it's, it, it's going. <laughs> um, th this has given me the opportunity to actually look back, <clears throat> excuse me, on... On, uh, I mean, I've been screenwriting since 1985 and uh, having very, uh, encountering sort of the subject matter of, of today's talk um, in different contexts um, over those years. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm very excited and very happy to see the business changing. I think we're, we're really on onto something uh, new and greater, um, especially with the digital entities that are out there now with, I kind of mentioned the other day of everything from Amazon and, and Netflix, they're recognizing that audi there are audiences worldwide that want to see themselves represented. And they're putting money into those regions to develop original material um, for, for that. Um, but I, I can't help but go back to uh, a number of years ago. This was so I, uh, late 90s, I think, maybe. No, it was actually a little after. I mean, it might have been this century, actually. I take that back. I, <laughs> I, I, wrote, um, I wrote a project for Spike Lee at his company um, about uh, Oscar Michaud, who, if no one knows the name, um, he's really the patron saint of independent filmmaking in America, you know, I mean, this is a, this is a black man who was um, a railroad porter for many years, saved his, uh, saved his money, bought land in North Dakota, 
uh, and became a farmer up there with all the Russian and Swedish immigrants and then started writing novels and then segued into filmmaking. And he's recognized as almost like the counterpart to D.H. Um, uh, to D.W. Griffith, I mean. Um, and he wrote uh, and produced, he's given credit for being the, the very first black filmmaker to use a black cast and black uh, um, uh, workers with um, and craftsmen on, on his films uh, to create feature films uh, for black audiences. And it was really in response to what D.W. Griffith was doing and he was doing it with absolutely no money. Um, unfortunately, there's, you know, much of, most of his films, he was really prolific. A lot of his stuff is gone uh, now and there's still searches looking. Occasionally a negative will pop up in Europe of all places. You probably know more about this, Ben, than I do um, in, in terms of some of his stuff still surfacing in Europe. But anyway, um, the, the point was, is just that uh, I knew nothing about this. How I got the job, I, I still <laughs> can't kind of figure that out, but I was very, um, very thankful for it because it opened my eyes to so much. I, I love research. And this, um, this story in particular just opened my eyes to the Black experience in the late, um, late uh, 19th century and then into the early part of the 20th century especially with, with uh, men who served in World War I and, the, and in the Spanish-American War and this and that, um, and their fate, and then coming back, the riots in Chicago, there were riots in, uh, obviously in Tulsa and all this stuff, but Oscar Micheaux was hyper aware of all this stuff and that was going on and felt a real need to communicate that to, uh, uh, to the people. And, and unfortunately, so much of it has got has been forgotten. Um, and he died, you know, um, uh, he was probably running from the IRS and <laughs> every, everyone else, but he is, his last wife burned a lot of his letters and his manuscripts and everything else. Um, there, so there's really, his life is still full of mystery. But to me, he is a symbol still for the, the struggle to, um, show people of color in a, in a true dimension, you know, as opposed to just uh, um, being um, sort of token characters, you know? And, yeah, you know, yeah. I know that was a part of your, of the lexicon of your, in your, your booklet um, of tokenism. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we talked about this briefly, but it really is about that ability to, to, bring in the human element of all the people that we have and then the other piece of it you know what you're saying is like these names like how come they're not household names right, right? and so and you know like and so the audience knows too is like one of my missions is to bring back people that have been erased or marginalized from history mm -hmm. into our screen so rand and i aside from him being like my one of my actually two of my screenwriting <laughs> classes instructors he, um, he and I bonded over World War I because, uh, Randall, your family history and your interests, but also, um, you know, it took me decades to find out about these Indian sepoys. And so um, literally there were 1.3 million South Asian Indian soldiers that fought in World War I, 73,000 of them died, um, and 400,000 of that 1.3 million were Muslims. And so, you know, so where's the movie about that? You know, right. where are we seeing that? And these, and these Sepoys, I've only seen them twice. Um, and I'm interested in, you know, if people have it put in the chat, if they've seen Sepoys elsewhere. I've seen them for maybe 10 minutes in War Horse, um, represented in a movie in 1917. Other than that, I, I haven't seen them. They, I, I haven't seen it in many years, but I was going to say they might have been uh, in Gallipoli, uh, Peter. Weir's film. I don't know. Does anybody else recall that? But I don't. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Definitely yeah. underrepresent, upper, underrepresented. But it makes to your point, right? That we're and I know that Rebecca and Kat also talk about decolonization. Is just again, why aren't they in the front forefront of our memories? And so, if we really yeah. want to see this inclusion, household names, uh, we you know media is so powerful, and so being able right. to bring them back or have them represented 
through something on Netflix, through a feature, whenever we can get back into movie theaters or, you know, the YouTube clips, you know, some, you know, so many variety of how we have all of these, um, all of these different ways of getting content today. Why aren't we seeing them? If I can it's, piggyback on that just a second, Ash, which is that, um, uh, in terms of how the media perpetuates, I think one of the one of the things that certainly in, in the the filmmaking world of this country was uh, the western. Okay, mm. uh, <laughs> but, uh, okay. Uh, you know a whole genre that that is as old as filmmaking is in itself here in this country. Well, what's interesting is that always the cowboys are represented as white guys, and there's usually maybe white hats and black hats and whatever, but Statistically, I think it's been proven now that the majority of cowboys, quote as we know as cowboys, were black. Yep. <laughs> or mixture yep. Of, of Native American and, and black and whatever. And they came out of the Oklahoma territories and they came out of Texas and, and whatnot. Yes. Um, and many of them were former slaves as well, um, because this was an industry that, that rose up um, after the Civil War. You know, but but you you don't know that statistically because those that made started making films were whites and they were not you know they just didn't uh and, and part of it is they just probably didn't know either they always just assumed all cowboys yeah. were if i can piggyback on that uh, i would actually i think it's important to acknowledge that i am okay with people that you know have European descent or identify as white for them to write the stories that they know. I understand that. What I think it's important for us to clarify when we talk about inclusion is that people are willing to concede some of the space and realize that they don't monopolize the entire history you know like that there is a multiple points of view usually the history that we know has been told by the winners or just the folks that want that had the resources to frame that so i think that i I, I think that that's an important point to uh, maybe discuss or just bring up to the front is like i think it's awesome that I, I, you know, I've heard this conversation from different screenwriters of like, what should you write? Should you write what you know? Or should you, uh, you know, just do very good research? And I feel like it is something that needs to be evaluated in a case by case basis. It's hard to give a blanket statement about that. But I think it's important for us to be like, well, the when you infuse your writing with your personal experience with the things that you care about, it's going to be the most honest it can be, right? So I feel like I've gotten a lot of people that when I tell them my life story, they're like, uh, and there are writers as well, they're like, oh, you know, can I make a write a movie about you? And I'm like, how about I write the movie about me? Because <laughs> I know. Yeah. Um, we can maybe collaborate, you know, it's that kind of situation where, uh, and, and I feel like uh, I also, you know, I'm a very white passing person. I was born in Venezuela. I have some European ancestry, um, but I also have indigenous ancestry uh, and black ancestry. So it's, it's a weird place to be sometimes. And um, I'm kind of losing my train, my train of thought, but I <laughs> wanted, yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, I totally, I'm totally down for people just sticking to the stories that they know, but that they should try to think about like what has not been said before and how can, instead of me taking up that space for that person, how can we raise this other person so we can collaborate together and then make this project more inclusive uh, and whatnot. Yeah, no, I totally am Ash, with you. Yeah, yeah, David. If I could piggyback just briefly, uh, you know, it starts with the history books and the, and the problem, uh, and Rebecca, you just mentioned it, you know, who, who, who tells the history. Mm -hmm. And right now we have school boards in Texas and places in Oklahoma that, that, you know, write out of history stuff that other people have tried to put in. Um, so what strikes me about that is, you know, history is being mistold and has been for a, a long time, uh, then it's incumbent upon us as filmmakers and writers to, uh, to as best we can write that wrong. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, no, I, because, I do ag I agree. Because the Go textbooks ahead, are not in control, are not, are being controlled by people who, who uh, resent the truth. Right, and I actually, yeah. in terms of textbooks, I think that we, a part of colonization had told us that, uh, that the only history that is right is the one that we can prove and go back to uh, textbooks and, and ruins and, 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 you know, and reference back. And there's so much untold history that was literally beaded from people, you know, like my, my husband, he's Micmac from, um, from Canada. And this is a big thing of generational trauma that sometimes, um, you know, some, some books get wrong facts about his people that his grandmother thinks that his grandmother told him. And it's like, well, you know, I totally understand that we, you want to be able to, when you do your research, go back to things that you can trust. But I think that we need to keep an open mind and realize that because of what we think education is, uh, we should really uh, also prioritize, prioritize talking to people directly um, and realize that a lot of these people, like, you know, uh, a lot of Mexicans, for example, uh, I know that probably Kat can speak better about this than me, but it's crazy how much connection to the in, to indigenous cultures Mexico has and folks because they're colonized, because being tied to being an Indian is a bad thing uh, for them or socially, uh, they denounce that part of their history. So even though they look like they're people of color, they don't, they're scared to know, to go back to their roots and find out where they come from. And I feel like whenever there's someone that, um, that wants to create a more cultural story, you know, that goes outside of the day-to-day -day lives in the present that we live in, I would like to encourage people to go back to your roots because at some point, all of us were tribal, you know, like before thousands of years of war, everybody had some connection to the land, some connection to, you know, the seasons. And all of that is also underrepresented. And that is the place where I think white folks can like, reclaim what is theirs you know what is and and that way they can also in a way stay in their lane if that makes sense of like they can empower themselves about like this part of their story that hasn't been told that many times have been washed by christianity you know uh yeah there's a problem with christianity you know <laughs> totally that's totally cool but i think that we should just it's like uh of being open-minded to the possibility that there's other perspectives to history that have not been told. If that makes yeah, sense. no, absolutely. And I get asked this question actually. Um, so, you know, <laughs> it, should white people only write about white stories? Okay. Mm -hmm. And so my whole thing is, look, let's look through this lens through equity and justice. So I'll give a personal example. Um, there is a fascinating story about the six triple eight and they uh, were an all African, uh, all black, woman u.s american battalion and they were um they served in uh england and in france i that's an awesome awesome story but i know through my an equity and justice lens so equity representation justice in terms of fairness i only want to write that story with a black co-author uh co-screenwriter co and then you know when i want to get a producer or a director um, tied to it, I do want it to, prefer, my preference would be a black director or a black producer, um, because all along the yeah, other lines, there'll be different people who will be influencing how the story will go. But as much as I can influence as a screenwriter and somebody who doesn't, can't, is not black, um, how can I bring this story and how can I bring equity and, and, and justice to the story? Um, and, you know, and I, like my, I have a, um, TV dramedy, um, and it's a South Asian um, female lead. And so I feel confident and good about writing about that. What I don't feel confident in and where I need to talk to others who are part of this community is that the, that the character, my main character is a lesbian woman. And so as somebody who is not part of that community, I need somebody else to be like, hey, 
yes, this is how we should write to tell the story in a really authentic way. And so I think that, you know, we can't say, no, you can't write this because you came from this part or your ancestors, that's exclusionary. Like that makes no sense. Um, but we can be much better about what stories are told, what truths are told through like, you know, oral traditions that were passed on versus um, like uh, R Randall was just saying, you know, the burnt um, uh, letters or memos or scripts, you know, who knows where all these things are. It could be at, a, at some garage sale right now. I mean, you know, <laughs> like it really could be. And it's like, oh my gosh, there's this rich history there. Um, and, and so it's just, it's, it is really, you know, if we really want to talk about inclusion, it's bringing all that and then really bringing in a frame of reference when we're writing is how am I being equitable about what I'm writing and how am I bringing this fairness, this justice to the story instead of going into really harmful stereotypes. And this is where when we talk about the media, the media is actually fantastic in terms of being able to get content. But when the content is influenced by characters or really one or two dimensions instead of the real human element, we end up, you know, when I don't know something, I go to media. And so if my media is biased or I don't know where to go for the authentic ways of looking, and I highlight in this book of ways where you can get into getting more authentic views about the characters you want to write if you don't know about them, is, you know, we need to change our media. And I think that is, that's really powerful. Um, and, and even though it may be hard to get some of our items, you know, produced and it's getting easier, I do absolutely believe that. Um, but you know, where do we do as, as a starting point as writers, what do we do to influence the media and everything that we're consuming? I think that's such a, it's an important conversation and being able to have the conversation that's really honest with folks um, is for me is really important. I think, I just, that, oh, I think um, is this that cat? point, yeah. yeah, this is cat meow. Um, this points to something that has been brought up in a lot of media circles that I've been participating in recently, um, talking about one, the voice, like paying attention to whose voice it is and actually having the real voice, the oral history, if you're talking about historical or the person who was actually involved in the story being told. And then the other part is uplifting people by opening a door when you when you are in a position that you have a you may have a script that's being looked at that you're gonna uh, or a story you're gonna write um being sure that as you go through life you're opening a door for someone else as well um and that you continue to remember that that's it's integral in a change happening is is for us to share the privilege no matter how small I love that. Yeah. And it's so true. And it's, it's that collaboration piece. And what Randall was saying and David is like how much you can learn um, really quickly before I get back to Randall, Randall, cause I know he's got questions for me cause he likes nuances. Um, what, what Randall was saying about um, the black cowboys is actually 100% correct. And um, if you want, you know, if folks can follow me on Instagram, I actually have the story of Bass Reeves and Bass Reeves is the, uh, is the, that we know of, is the first uh, US Deputy Marshal west of the Mississippi. And he was actually a fugitive slave for a number of years. And so he was living amongst the different uh, nations in Oklahoma. And so he actually learned their languages and he learned their customs. And then when 1865 came around, well, hey, we need somebody um, to be able to understand the culture in Oklahoma, if we're, you know, if we're going to be, um, I, unfortunately, like looking at the land and, you know, seeing if there's criminals around. Um, so he ended up being the best person for it because of how much he knew about that land. Um, and what's interesting is that when you read about him, um, folks say that he was the, ori that he was the or origin of the Lone Ranger, but he's never shown as a black man. He, the Lone Ranger that I grew up with was a white man. Um, but I think that retelling and that inclusivity is coming back when, if, for folks who might have seen uh, The Watchmen mm -hmm. on HBO because they, they, they show a black cowboy um, and a black um, uh, Lone Ranger. So I think that's fascinating. Well, that Watchmen starts with Bass Reeves in a silent film. Um, uh, Bass Reeves is like a rock star in my, in my world. So I... <laughs> Me too. He's amazing. Uh, he's, you know, he actually, he, he fathered about 16 kids and, and um, uh, arrested one of them uh, for murder. Um, yeah, so, yeah. So, I mean, that's a story in of itself. This was a tough guy. 
Yeah. Um, but he, he was in law enforcement for many, many, many years and was illiterate, um, but spoke four or five different of the, of the nation's dialects uh, yeah. out there. And, and see what, what most people don't know, and I'll, I'll get off my history wagon. No, here second, it's but, inclusivity, but, but it's but, right, or it's all about yeah, this, right? Um, the, the, Oklahoma, the Oklahoma territories, or what was called Indian territory at that time, was formed by the five civilized tribes that had all been removed to different parts, you know, and, and, and set up out there. But they, they had their own police force forces and they had their own sense of, of justice. Um, so just because you were Native American doesn't, didn't mean that you, like the Kiowa or the, the Cherokee, got along with the Chippewa or whatever. Mm -hmm. They had different customs, different languages. The Modocs were there too, Randall. Oh, yeah. They're, okay. Yeah. Well, I was out there too because of, uh, of the Miami Indians that I was writing about again at, in, in the later uh, time period or different time period. But um, uh, it was uh, it was fascinating because only federal officers, law enforcement officers, could go in there um, into the nations um, because white outlaws would go in there and hide because the Native American law enforcement uh, or police or the light horses they were called they were they could not arrest white men. Mm -hmm. And only, only federal marshals could go in there and arrest white men. So it was a really interesting, you know, time period. And Bass Reeves was just, uh, was able to go through, navigate through all of that. It was just quite, yeah. quite an amazing character, you know, um, an amazing guy. And this is the thing, is that he should be a household name. He should be. Uh, yeah, right? Absolutely. <laughs> I you mean, know, but, I don't want to know about the Lone Ranger. I want to know Bass Reeves. Right, right. <laughs> and, and, and kudos to Watchmen, which sort of brought, you know, brought that connection there, you know, yeah. in, in terms of that. They reinvented it in, in a way that was, um, uh, I thought was, was very clever and, and, and good, but it's still, it's not the Bass Reeves story. Now, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, of, of fiction around Bass Reeves as well and myth, mm -hmm. uh, because again, these are, these were people who, they didn't have um, their champions uh, really around, uh, other than Judge Isaac Parker, at the hanging judge at Fort, Fort yep. Smith, who yeah. uh, loved them. And, and that's the thing is like, you know, it's about opportunity, but it's also like folks have been around. So, and we should be, yeah. we should be talking about them and how much they've influenced our current culture. So let me I ask can tell you, you like topically there, or more recently, um, at least through my childhood, something that pointed me towards just even having the thought that oh, a black man could be a cowboy was um, Lawrence Fishburne as Ca Cowboy Curtis in Pee-wee's Playhouse. And, I, and that mm. act literally started my brain thinking, wait a minute. Wait. Well, Lawrence I'm gonna start to think about this. Wait a minute, because I had never before him seen a black cowboy. Yeah. I did grow up in Idaho too, which is a whole other thing, but. Right. Yeah. I uh, also would like to comment on that. Uh, I'm, I'm not, well, okay, well that, I'm sorry. This just reminds me of the fact that I think we should remember that because Hollywood is such an influential uh, machine when it comes to film, like what we create here in this country, even if it is on a local level, it is very impactful because of imperialism uh, to other countries. So because I grew up in Venezuela, and I, I don't think I even introduced myself, but uh, my name is Rebecca. I was born in Venezuela and uh, my native tongue is Spanish. Um, it's very hard to be able to work in English and write in English, but I managed it. <laughs> and I always have this little fear in the back of my head that I'm making like a tiny little mistake and you have this pressure of like, well, you're representing a bunch of people. So you have this really high standards of like trying to you know, do your best to put that, you have the best foot forward of the folks of your community, right? But, uh, but I grew up in a space where all I wanted to do was be an Americanized kid. Like, that's what the cool movies and, and TV series that I was watching, that's what, I, I felt like there was something wrong with me because there was no one like me in film or TV. And to this day, it is still a struggle sometimes to be able to say, hey, you know what? I am allowed to show up as I am. 
and to occupy space and to, um, you know, write a screenplay that is perhaps bilingual or to address the fact that um, I went to a Catholic church for 14 years and I was around a lot of toxic femininity and a lot of like teenage drama situation. Like I wanted to run away from that as much as possible. So I turned to American TV for that. But now living here and realizing like the richness of what it meant to grow up in Venezuela and like how much, um, how important you know it is to connect back with your roots and your ancestors it makes me kind of relive some of the things that i thought were in bo were boring like you know what we're telling to future generations by being more inclusive with our writing is saying you know you're allowed not only that these people exist and that we should consider them but the folks that are actually diverse they feel like, oh my God, you know, there's other people like me. Like that is incredibly empowering. And if that didn't start to happen uh, in this golden age of television that we live in right now, I don't think I would have considered going through film. I think I would have like put my head down and said, oh, well, you know, communications, maybe <laughs> to be a reporter, <laughs> even though I hate being in front of a camera. Um, but I do think that, you know, obviously we have to create something that moves us first and then helps other people. But, but to be, to just be aware the same way that we can be more sustainable, you know, like when we buy something, we can think about like, what's going to happen to that thing after we're done with it. Uh, we can also think about, you know, what, what good can we do with the story? What kind of thought provoking themes do we want to bring forward? So. I love that. And, you know, I'm like getting chills on a summer day when you say that for two reasons. And then Randall, I'll get to your question. Thanks for your patience, Randall. Um, is that when I saw Never Have I Ever on Netflix, um, literally that was the first time I'd seen a South Asian Indian woman lead, a uh, young woman lead for the first time. And I write about this in my book is that um, the belonging I felt and the cultural nuances because it was written some of the episodes is written by Mindy Kaling from the office and so I and I can relate to that and literally first time it was absolutely amazing and I was on a podcast a couple of weeks ago with a woman who's a quarter South Asian Indian and you know I told her that you know I have the script with the lesbian uh, South Asian lead and we got into a conversation about like that belonging piece um, you know to be able to be like looking at something that you know we're such consumers of content. And um, had she had somebody that was a lesbian character that she could identify with, how, you know, she was recounting that um, being able to see herself in there could have really changed herself and, and, um, you know, growing up, especially as a teenager. So I think it's just so powerful because we can talk about in, uh, inclusion and diversity and multiculturalism, whatever words you want to use, they're so important. They're absolutely important. The thing for me is belonging. And, you know, like the belonging screenwriter doesn't flow as well as the inclusive screenwriter. So we're going with the inclusive screenwriter, but it is about belonging. You know, do I feel good here? Do I feel, and it's for me saying it, not any, what other, other people are trying to do to bring me in. It's, do I feel like I am seen? Do I feel that I'm being represented? Is there somebody that I can identify with that, um, you know, that I would be talking about? And I, and I think that I definitely miss that. Uh, when I look at my um, media consumption, um, but I'm hoping to change that right for future generations. And and I, I'm that's 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 it, again. I've got chills on a summer day. Randall, I know you got a question for me. I do, and I've been talking too much anyway. But I, I I'll just make this the last uh, sort of thing for for those of us who you know. I mean, I'm as white as you can get, um, but I have an insatiable you know, interest in the world and uh, other cultures and history and all of that. Um, and so if I get the chance to write about something that is completely different from, you know, like the Oscar Michelle yeah. or the Miami Indians yeah. or wh whatever it was that I, that I had, uh, you know, been hired to write before, um, I, I want to take it because I, I seize it as an opportunity to learn, you know, so much, you know. So um, that said, um, I found, and I came up uh, against this a couple of times in research that I was doing, that when I did reach out um, to 
let's say tribal en entities or, mm -hmm. or whatever, um, they, uh, there was a lot of suspicion and sometimes mm -hmm. they just don't want to talk to the white guy, you know, um, because again, it's the cultural uh, appropriation. Now I know in your, in, in your book here, you're talking about one of the things is as we go forward is to, is, is to do your research and then and to also look for collaborators here but um for those that that still kind of meet resistance what do you have to say because i'm i'm doing my due diligence yeah, you're, doing, yeah. you're doing what you need yeah, yeah, yeah. and well, i'm sure yeah. i hope i'm speaking for some uh, a lot of others who whether they be directors or writers actors or whatever that would want to be doing some research as well um, yeah. Yeah. No, you know, it's interesting. I actually found that when I was trying to get information about the black military leaders. Um, and so I contacted the six triple eight. Uh, there's actually a, um, a group out in Virginia that is specific to the six triple eight. And I still don't have an email or a, a callback uh, in regards to my, my messages that I left. Um, so I think persistence is key. And again, if you're coming with it through that equity and justice lens, I really do believe somebody will, um, will, will talk to you. And the reason is, is that if you come into it saying, there's a clear distinction. If you come into it and saying, hey, I'm Randall, these are my credits. Hey, look at me, I did, you know, I did these movies. And now I wanna write about you. <laughs> you know, oh, well, that's very different then, hey, you know, I, I have this interest um, and I really want to co-create um, this space with you. Uh, I think and that, that's that approach, right? You know, it's a very different way of saying something. And that co-creation piece is that inclusion piece. And, and, and you know, you may get a lot of uh, shut doors or you may not get messages back, but that's what we do when we're querying or <laughs> when we're doing our work anyway, right, as screenwriters. So I think it's um, I think it's important to um, to really just go ahead and 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 do this work um, and be persistent about it and and knock on as many doors as you possibly can. And this is where I say um, I emphasize in the book you got to do the work. You know, it's not going to be one of those things where you're going to be writing it and you're done and and all that fun stuff. Um, it is going to be about the space where you can. Um, do your due diligence as much as you possibly can and and try to find the different groups and one thing that i also say in the book is that sometimes face to face is not always possible so what i also recommend is for example if you can look at work that has been done by certain by a member of a group to understand more um so that way you can get you know sometimes you just can't get in person but as i think as long as you're doing that due diligence and you can find items that are created by members of groups, then you can start start that that um, that passage and and start the writing. And I also think that when you have something that is meaningful, um, and somebody's like, "Oh wow!" Like I would really appreciate it if somebody really showed that they did research on a certain topic about Fiji or India or you know the indigenous folks in Canada. I'm I'm from Canada too. Um, and so that would like open my eyes. Like, hey, this person is serious. And they really are trying to, um, you know, write something that's outside of harmful or characters. Um, so it's not definitely not easy. I'm just, you know, and my book is not something that I'm saying is easy. <laughs> you got to do the work. But I think that persistence and showing up authentically that you want to bring equity and justice to this story um, will take you um, into places where you need to be. Ash? If, if I may yeah. comment on that, I think it is important to do that work with an attitude of humbleness. Um, I think that when we come from places of privilege, because I think that I, um, before I emigrated uh, to here, I was part of the white people group of Venezuela, you know, like very, um, very close ties to, you know, European grandparents on one side of my family, very white looking. I spoke English since I was a kid. I went to a private school. So I, you know, I, I can totally identify of that, that side of me where I feel like there's other Latinx people that have had it way harder, uh, particularly because I immigrated here. I have documents, you know, like that kind of situation puts me in a place of privilege um, uh, against other people from the community. I think that is important for us to stay in a place of humbleness and not be entitled because in a way, when you haven't had, 
uh, when you haven't had a barrier, you know, when you do not know what it means to be underrepresented, you may seem like, oh, I'm just asking a question about someone that's simple. It's just about my character. You know, you may not understand that when you ask these questions that are very personal to these folks, you could be triggering some really horrible things. Like I know that on my husband's side um, and on some of my indigenous Venezuelan side, um, I have grandparents and we have family members who they do not, they cannot speak about that without like just you know, crumbling into tears, just like they rather just not talk about it because it's just so hard for them to recall how they were raped or how they how their family members were murdered. And like, it's this really weird place where you can, you know, I feel like, again, if you're coming from a nice place when you're being honest and you're being accommodating of like, you know, these things can be really triggering for some people and it requires a lot of emotional labor to be able to explain it to someone who doesn't know, you know, being uh, accepting that and realizing that, that, that it takes extra, well, it takes time and it takes effort. If you can also compensate people that provide you with guidance, I think that that's a definitely a big way to be able to say, you know, like, I see you, I appreciate your time. Um, I, I agree that what happened to you, it's tough. And I think that Cat Meow and I have a very special relationship because in the ways that I have issues talking about my past and my trauma, she empowers me and she's shared with me that I'm able to help her do the same. So 100%. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. Uh, just to your point, I do mention that um, you got to provide some type of compensation and sometimes people may be like, no, that's okay. But if, you know, but if, but ask them what they would like and you have no, no privilege or no right to, for somebody to share their thoughts with you. And, you, and, I, and I get even asking maybe triggering, and this is, you know, I don't have all the answers around that. I can only help guide. Um, but I think it, it's how you do it 100% and, and that no one owes you their time. You know, they don't. Because um, I don't want to talk about my oppression with everybody. Um, but if you pay me, sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, really quickly, before I get back to you, David, is it, what, what do you mean by compensate? I give examples in my book of it, whether sometimes it could be a thank you, sometimes it could be a cup of coffee, um, you know, uh, sometimes it could be uh, some money if somebody wants it. Um, I think there are different ways of compensating. Um, but I think once you get consent for somebody to share their thoughts with you in their life, I mean, they're, they're telling you their life, um, is that you ask them what they would like in return and see what you can get for them. Um, David, you're going to ask a, uh, a question. Yeah, I mean, going off of Randall's uh, point about working with the Native tribes and Rebecca, your um, uh, humbleness, uh, and Ash, in your book, uh, part of this is, uh, you know, um, creating a relationship, a collaborative re relationship, and not being afraid to ask questions and asking permission to ask questions. And, and to be, uh, you know, and to treat that whole process with respect, both all three of you are saying that. And I've done a bunch of work with the Yakimas and I was brought into, um, and this is an example of, of how sort of jarring and, and uh, uh, heavy this, the, the, that approach can be. Uh, I was brought in, we had two weeks to turn around a project where we were gonna do a film for a convention of the affiliated tribes of the Northwest. And it, the story had to be about the affiliated tribes and their formation and then the Yakima history. And, and um, they fed me all this information and I had to write the script in like three days. And, and, uh, wow. and, and it's just, this, it's another one of those, uh, it's another trail of tears. It's just a horrifying mm -hmm. story uh, of, of lies and, and, um, cheating and you know just the, the, all that stuff and and I knew that the audience was going to be mixed of uh, tribal and and uh, Caucasian people and we had a spokesperson uh, who's an elder George and I gave him the script because uh, he was going to help vet it for me and I said George you know I got um, I have to tell you that you know I this is the first that I've read this whole story and put all, and I put this thing together and I know what the audience is going to be. And I, frankly, I, I left a bunch of all that stuff in and, you know, there may be some people that will be offended in the audience. And I just want you to know that 
that's my thinking. And he looked at me straight in the eyes and said, David, do you think genocide is offensive? And it just, I mean, the, the, the it makes me cry just thinking about that because even in the writing and the, and the understanding of the horror, I didn't feel it until he said it. So being able to sort of open yourself up to Randall and I've been in that position where we're going to experience some pain, some pushback uh, in, in participating in that way, uh, but then also taking on the feeling. It's uh, the only way you can do that is to have that relationship. The other thing, uh, one last, just because I'm here, uh, one of the things, another thing in Ash's book, her idea of belonging to me really strikes me. I like the word much better than inclusive because I think belonging is a basic human need. We all want it. And it's a, it's a great way of approaching uh, how to um, be inclusive in your writing. I know there's a bunch of ISA writers in here. I see them uh, uh, to uh, open up this idea in your heart about how everybody wants to be, wants to belong. And it's not about belonging to uh, to a dominant tribe or belonging to a minority tribe, but it's about wanting belonging uh, with other humans. I think that's a great point in your book. And I like that approach a lot. Well, I got to thank you for it because you, you, you pushed me to that, to that point. Uh, David was one of my uh, draft readers and um, you know, what, what he brought up was that, um, that real feel of, uh, of as screenwriters, you know, we're, we're telling these stories, right? And at whatever level, we're not, we're not here. People don't watch something um, because of the plot or they don't watch it for the, the setting. I do. Um, <laughs> but what we look for is that human connection. And, and, you know, that's where we want these empathetic characters, right? I mean, why do we talk about character and character development so much um, when we're building those scripts? Because we want people to empathize with this character. And we also want to be able to empathize with the villain or the antagonist, right? Because there's a whole backstory around this person too. And, you know, you may not belong with the villain, <laughs> but you, you can sympathize because we're like we were talking earlier, is um, having a true human experience, that three-dimensional character, uh, instead of, uh, you know, just a character. Um, that I think when we, are, um, when we are in a space where there is, um, where we're not really showing that human person and showing how they belong or showing uh, different folks um, to get us to a space where we're really showing belonging, um, we're missing out. And, and how can we also translate that to, well, I saw this character, you know, what does that mean for my neighbor? And I think, you know, because power media is so powerful. Um, we have such a great space and opportunity to, um, to really bring, um, to bring all of this and bring, you know, that belonging, that representation um, to not just our screens, but also in our hearts and to the world. I just want to apologize for my grammatical error in the chat. It's pretty funny, um, but I'm recovering from eye surgery and so it's hard for me to type. Oh, um, I actually would love for to hear from Cat Meow a little bit that hasn't been able to speak much since we only have about four minutes left. Yeah. Um, can you give us your two cents? Because I know you've been doing a lot of work on equity and open signal, and I think that everybody has a lot to learn from you. I, I know I have a lot to learn from you. I think that, um, thank you so much, Rebecca. I appreciate that. And thanks everybody for being here. I think that something that, that will only improve um, our writing skills and our ability to connect and genuinely invest in equity is taking the time to listen. And that time piece is super crucial. And that's what I was trying to say in the chat is, you know, I know that this industry, there's tons of deadlines and tons of this and that, but if you have any inkling, any ounce of privilege or any way to push back, it's uncomfortable and it might put you at risk. But I think if we're willing to like get into that uncomfortable place, push back, say, you know what, I'm talking with these folks, they need more time and, and try to build it into the contracts, try to build it in to, to know that if it's a sensitive subject, you will need double the time you think you're gonna need. Um, and that'll allow your, your, you to not only build that time for a really good story, but will help you build time to maintain and sustain that relationship after the story. It'll help you build that foundation so that it isn't just a story, so that these folks or communities that you're working with continue to be in your life after that story. Yeah, fight. 
I, I say that too. Fight, fight for your scripts, fight for the people, fight for the story. 100%. I love that. Thank you. Uh, we got to wrap it up. Um, I just really quickly before we thank you, I know I told Rebecca that she'd be able to plug one thing really quick as well before we say goodbye. Yeah. And thank you. So Rebecca, if you want to plug that. Yeah, sure. Thank you. This actually ties in perfectly with we were talking about open signals. So actually, thanks to Cat Meow, uh, I became aware of the importance of the 2020 census. And I think it is absolutely important in this conversation about inclusion and equity um, to think about how uh, there's historically the same way that people haven't been, histories of people have not been recorded equally. Uh, we have not been counted communities well. And because of that, communities have become underfunded. Um, and, you know, I know we're in a crazy pandemic. Obviously, the census is for a lot of us in the back of our brain, particularly for what the Census Bureau, you know, considers hard to count people. So BIPOC people, uh, children under five, people that are houseless, people that are part of the LGBTQIA community, um, people who live with disabilities, uh, people that live in rural communities, all of these folks, uh, you know, you need to do extra work to be able to count them correctly and accurately. And, and this is incredibly important because it's tied to public services, it's tied to political representation, um, and you know, because we have a pandemic, it's been really hard to be able to make sure that folks are okay. So Open Signal is a Census Assistance Center. I'm their census person. So if you know of anybody that needs any support, that needs to clear out some doubts, I'm an asylee from Venezuela. So I totally understand that people, and, and even just American citizens are within totally their right to feel uncomfortable about giving their personal information to the government. So just, I wanna reassure them that reassure you that it's safe and that it's incredibly important so we created a cool collaborative video project that's also a raffle so we're asking folks to use any digital camera they have it could also be you know your smartphone as long as you use it horizontally um, and you tell us why the census is important for you if you don't know what to say please reach out I'll put my email on the chat box is our Gonzalez at opensignalpdx.org and I can give you a ton of pointers of what to say uh, but particularly for me because I can't vote yet and I'm working to get my per, um, permanent residence uh, the census is a great way for me to be able to have a say like I'm so used to being told oh no you know what you you're you have no voice and whatever decisions the community you know your community is doing even though it totally affects me so it is very empowering for me to be able to help make sure that my community is funded um and and it's just it makes me aware that i have constitutional rights oh my god i didn't even like that's <laughs> so um all of that is super important. And I have a cool poster that I can put in. Is it possible for me to send it to December or to sure, Ben? Yeah, send it you, us. you can put in a follow-up email. Is that, is that good or, or no? Yeah, go ahead and send it. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, that's all yeah. that, like how to do that. And we would love your support because Open Signal has this, um, public access channels. So we want to be able to reach out people who are still scared um, and they don't have social media and they need to be able to see different kinds of people from different ages, from you know different skin colors, uh, different nationalities, uh, say that the census is safe and that you matter, basically. So thank you. I know we're a little bit over time, so. Yeah. Well, Thank everyone, you. yeah, and then remember to come back in two weeks. We'll, we'll have another one, and hopefully we'll see you out at the drive-in. That'd be great. Just really quickly, folks, if you want to connect with me, uh, all together, one word, all lowercase, the inclusive screenwriter. You can find me on Instagram, um, Gmail, and also my .com. Um, that's my website. So if, as long as you can uh, as long as you can remember the inclusive screenwriter, you're good to go. I'd love, love to go ahead and connect with folks. Thanks, Ash.
Thanks, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, all. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Wonderful. Nice to meet you guys. Dave, I'll thank talk you. to you later. Okay.